Hey guys, Phil Baumhard here. So for this video, I want to show you some swords from the Royal Ontario Museum. They got a nice collection of about 10 swords and other artifacts dating from the 11th century to the 16th century, many of which would fall into the category of what we would call today as long swords, bastard swords, or two-handed swords. In the description on the display, they divide the two swords into two broad groups, basically pre-1300 AD and post-1300. The swords before 1300 were made primarily to cut, with broad, flat, sharpened edges running parallel with each other, curving only at the tip. After 1300, with the development of plate armor, it caused swords to be made for thrusting primarily, so the edges were narrower and tapered more sharply towards the point. The cross-section of the blade was made thicker and stronger, some swords even being a diamond shape in their cross-section. So the first sword we'll look at is one with what's called a Brazil nut type pommel. They've got it dated between 1100 and 1150 AD, and it's either German or English in origin. It's got a steel blade with an iron guard and pommel. This sword falls into the type 10 of the oak shot typology, and was a common sword of the early medieval period. This type of sword has clear roots in the earlier Viking Age swords, and sets the foundation for the later two-handed swords we're going to look at. The grip is made for one hand only, leaving the offhand available for a shield. The sloping shape of the Brazil nut type pommel provides an improvement on the often straight Viking era sword pommels, providing additional protection to the sword hand. It's interesting to see the grain of the steel in the grip where it was compressed during forging, and the cross guard is significantly longer than those found in the Viking Age, and it also looks like there might be some damage near the point, possibly from its use in battle. The second sword is also of English or possibly German origin, dating between 1270 and 1320 AD. The sword itself was found in Lancashire, England, but the blade and hilt are so similar to German swords of the period that they speculate it to be evidence of the international trade in sword blades that was conducted during the Middle Ages. It's interesting to note that it's got a narrower, deeper fuller than the Brazil nut sword, but it still maintains the spatulate type point. It's also fascinating to see that the wood grip is still intact, which is very rare for these type of swords, as well as the markings on the blade near the guard, and further down the blade on the fuller there is an inscription of what looks to be a shield. This third sword is probably the largest of the display, described as being Italian in origin, dating between 1280 and 1325 AD. This sword, among with several others in this exhibit, bear an Arabic inscription, placing it at the arsenal in Alexandria in Egypt, and while it was taken as the spoils of war from some long forgotten battle. And what's great about this is that it not only gives us some provenance as to the sword's previous history and previous life, but it also helped preserve it and allow it to survive to the present day where we can enjoy it in the context of this museum. It also has a very interesting S-shaped guard that dates from the 1400s, indicating that the sword received a new or upgraded hilt sometime during its lifetime. Another unique feature of this sword is the three narrow fullers on the broad blade. The fourth sword, while not as large as the third, is still a two-handed beast. The disc-shaped pommel on the sword is representative of the most prevalent type used on medieval swords. Before 1200 AD, the discs tended to be flat, while later types developed a sloped or chamfered pommel, like this one. It is cited as being German, dating to around 1350 and bears some unique inscriptions on the blade. This blade also appears to have some battle damage, denoted by the distinctive nicks and notches on the cutting edge. Sword number five starts the transition over to the thrust-centric type blades with acute points. This one too is Italian, dating between 1300 and 1350. The blade features a shallow broad fuller, similar to the first sword we looked at, but still has the gradual taper of the later swords and it bears the Arabic inscription indicating its housing in the Alexandria Arsenal around 1436. According to the Oakshot typology, this is a Type H1 style of pommel, being a squared variant of the standard disc pommel. Sword number 6 is also Italian, dating between 1300 and 1350, with markings from its time in the Alexandria Arsenal in 1368. It's interesting to note the abnormally wide tang. The geometry of this blade is very interesting with it having a half fuller and midway up changes over to a flattened cross section with double chisel edges forming the edge. This sword is also Italian, dating to 1369 with the Arabic writings placed on the unusually flattened ricasso. 
It is speculated that this sword was part of the loot seized by the Turks during their expansion period that culminated in the siege of Constantinople in 1453. This sword bears a narrow half fuller with a unique letter B inscription, which looks to me to be a maker's mark. It is also interesting to note that this sword was featured in the the Sword in the Age of Chivalry by Ewart Oakshot, and he describes it as being a type 19 in his typology. Sword number 8 dates between 1350 and 1400 from either Italy or England. The long, stiff, sharply pointed blade is ideal for thrusting. The blade design is indicative of the prevalence and quality of plate armor of the time and the necessary evolution of weapons that followed. The grip is made long for two-handed use, and the pommel is slightly tapered to allow the hand to rest on it for additional leverage. Sword number 9 dates between 1470 and 1480 from either Germany or the Netherlands and even retains the original wood grip which allows us a rare look at the way these two inner grips were tapered. So in the oak shot typology this is described as being a scent stopper style of pommel as he so describes it because of its clear similarity in shape to a perfume bottle. But what this type of pommel allows you to do is grasp the pommel fully in your left hand when wielding the sword with two hands and allows you to get full and complete leverage on the sword utilizing the full length of the sword's grip. This style of fighting is documented in the fighting manuals of the time. One of the most notable ones is written by Joachim Meyer. The guard also has a unique S shape which would be difficult to discern unless you are able to see it in person. This sword retains a stout thrust centric cross section but it is broadened in width for better cutting power as well. In the museum, there's also what they describe as a great sword, which is a term used in antiquity to describe this type of sword because of its notable larger size in comparison to its contemporaries, as the blades on great swords could range up to 40 inches long. This example is dated between 1280 and 1320, and it's probably French or German in origin. It's interesting to note the shallow fuller, as well as the battle damage on the well-preserved edge. Some of the other items included in this exhibit were spurs, a section of riveted mail, and a basal art. The basal art is an interesting dagger with a distinct eye-shaped guard to help lock the blade into the fighter's hands as well as provide protection to the top and bottom of the fist in either a hammer or reverse grip. The basal art is Swiss in origin and this example dates to the mid-1300s. The term basal art is most likely named after the city of Basel in Switzerland. Artwork of the time indicates that they were a popular item of a knight's kit almost like a sidearm, and were generally worn on the right hip. They were also widely used as civilians as a personal protection tool. From looking at the different color of discoloration on the blade versus the handle itself, it raises the question in my mind of whether the guard was forged separate from the blade and then forged welded together. Because the shape of the double-edged blade in, in conjunction with the eye-shaped handle would be very difficult in my mind to try to forge as one separate piece. So I'm curious to know how these were constructed in antiquity and whether this is a blade and handle forged well together. All right, well, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. And if you have a chance to visit the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Canada, I would definitely recommend doing it. They have quite a number of artifacts from all periods of history and a lot of edged weapons. So if you can, check it out. As always, thanks for watching. And until next time, be more Viking.